find our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who will give us the strength to endure, who will give us the strength and the power to come through any difficult situation. Good morning, saints. It's such a privilege and an honor to stand before each and every one of you this morning. And to our pastor, in his absence, Preston Thomas Thompson Jr., excuse me, officers, members, and friends, it's truly a blessing to be before you this morning and to be given the opportunity to bring the message. I have to admit one thing to you, saints. I have written this message twice. And I have heard it so many times. But each time, the Lord changed it. So I know that this message is for somebody. It is something that the Holy Spirit wants us to experience today. And because of that, I pray that God will allow me to be his vessel this morning to preach the word of God. So our message today will be taken from Romans, the 12th chapter. And we are going to read all of it, but I want to concentrate on the 5th through the 17th verse. So if we please, can please stand, as it is the custom of the house. And I will be reading from the NIV version. And it reads as follows. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves most highly than you ought to, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has di distributed in each of you. For just as us have, uh, just as we have one body, I'm sorry, and many members, these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, though many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is encouraged, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another, honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Amen. You may be seated. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray right now, God, that you will have your way in this message, God. As you give it, as you've given it to me, God, I'm only the messenger. But God, right now, I humble myself as I listen in obedience to the Holy Spirit, oh God. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that this will cause a release on those, Father God, who need to be released, God. And for those, Father God, who need to find their way in a church, God, I pray, God, that this message will enlighten, that it will reveal your purpose and your will for your people and for your church. God, now I submit to your will. I decrease so that you can increase in me. 
In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Well, as I said, our message for this morning is taken from Romans 12. And what I love about Romans is that it's about Paul. And Paul's letter to the epistle, to the people of Rome, the Jews, his Christian brothers and sisters. Paul always knew what the church needed. Although he could not get to them, he was a letter writer. He would write to them. He would explain to them. He would try to help them to understand what it is like to live in, su in submission of the Holy Spirit. I'm reminded of a song by Bishop Noel Jones that the choir would sing, and it was entitled, It's Not About Us. And that's what I want us to understand today. It's not about us, but it's about Jesus. The lyrics are, it's not about us, but it's about Jesus. It's not about you, but it's about Jesus. It goes on to say, I present my body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto you now, Lord. Everything I am and everything I'll be, I lay it at your feet. Amen. In Paul's letter in the text today, Paul writes to the Christians in Rome. And he's speaking directly to his Jewish brothers and sisters who had started this church during Pentecost. And let me give you a little background. As we know in Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, they were in one place on one accord. And the Holy Spirit came down like fire. And they all spoke in different tongues. But yet, someone was there to interpret. This is the church that Paul is speaking to. They were spreading their gospel along the return from their return from Rome. And now they had grown. They had grown enormously. And Paul felt a connection with them. And he, they want, and he wanted them to understand how they fit into God's plan. He provides them with an explanation on what it means to live in complete submission to the will of God. In the previous verses, Paul says that we are to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice and pleasing to God. Our behavior to be such that it creates a sweet aroma to Christ. It's not repulsive. It's not stink. It's a lovely fragrance, heavenly and divine. Paul po focuses on the righteousness of the church or the righteous church as it relates to God. It's ethical conduct, the behavior and morals of the church, that which pleases God. Not our works, don't get it mistaken, but our actions. He said we are to change our actions. We are to transform. Then our hearts will have to change. We can't no longer stay the same. You see, many of us believe that it's the brain that's the central place for reasoning and logic. But I'm here to tell you that it's the heart that does so. Because the heart pumps 1.5 million gallons of blood through the body every minute. And the scripture often considers and examines the heart. You see, God wants the heart. He wants a heart prepared to worship him. He wants a heart that is transformed. He wants a heart that will desire more of him. He wants to clean us up so that we may become more like him, desiring him, meditating on his word, worshiping and praising him. And in accordance with Matthew 23, 25 to 26, Jesus puts it this way. He said, woe to teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside, that's here, is full of greed and self-centeredness, self-indulgent. But he said, let me tell you something. First, clean the inside. That's the heart. Of the cup and the dish that out, your outside may be cleansed. Yes. So you have to change your heart. Then your behavior will change. You see, our hearts fester bitterness, envy, malice. But you know, the strange thing about it, it also holds love, joy, 
peace, long-suffering, all the fruit of the Spirit. Therefore, we need to consider what goes in it and what comes out of it because it impacts every aspect of our lives. Our God sees and he reads our heart even when we attempt to deceive ourselves. You see, because on the outside we look good, we act good, we are holier than thou. But what's going on in the, in, on the inside? If God were to ask you, tell me truly what's going on. Could you truthfully say, Lord, I'm whole. Or Lord, it's well. We have to examine ourselves and our heart. As Paul was speaking to the righteous church. Those who had accepted what Jesus had done for them on the cross. Paul said in Romans 5, 17, 18, if by the trespass of one man, death reigns through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and righteous reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Therefore, it is salvation that produces a changed heart. Your acceptance of the Lord and, and Savior Jesus Christ. That in turn changes our actions. You see, God looks at the heart. And we are to guard our hearts because everything that we do flows from it. So what's stored up in our hearts will eventually come out. You may hide, you may run, but you can't hide. And because of that, we have to allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and transform, renew, and re-educate us. But you know what I love about Paul? He then, after he speaks about all that, then he transitions. And he speaks to our thoughts and how we perceive ourselves. He warns us, he said, you know what? Don't think more highly of yourselves. Then you ought to, yes. You may have connections in high places. You may rub elbows with the ones or that one or this one. You may know the mayor. You may have the ear of your pastor. You may know your boss or have the ear of your boss or supervisor. But we should not have any room or give any room for pride or a higher opinion of ourselves. Amen. Amen. But we should imitate Jesus Christ and he will exalt you not the opposite. You see, we have to look at what we're doing. We have to be true to ourselves is what Paul is really saying. You know, on Sunday, we're one way. But what about Monday and the rest of the week? How do we relate to each other? Are we Christians? And can someone say, that's a Christian? Or there's something strange or something peculiar about us? Because after all, we are a peculiar people. And see, if we can't trust in our own goodness or if our egos are so broad and if our egos are so big, wouldn't that cancel or invalidate the debt Jesus paid on the cross for our sins? Think about that. Wouldn't it invalidate the mercies he extended to us, justification from guilt and sin, our identification in him, the Holy Spirit, and his promises to never leave or forsake us or to separate himself from us? Wouldn't it do that if we relied on just our works and our goodness? It would. Because what we're saying is we're bigger than that. We're bigger than Jesus. But it's not about us. It's about Jesus. You see, God has given each of us a special talent and gift. And we are to utilize these gifts for his glory to edify and bless others, not hoard them for ourselves, not be boastful, not show them off, not trying to be in everything and everybody in everybody's face, but we are to use it to edify the kingdom of God. Just as the human body has many parts and functions for a specific purpose, we, the body of Christ, must function as one unified body. Although diverse, we have to make Christ our common goal. We want to be effective in our service. And the only way we can do that is to submit ourselves to God and to win souls for the kingdom. Not by our ego, not by our wisdom or knowledge, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So he goes on to say, you know what? God gave you the gift of prophecy, but I want you to do something. I want you to prophesy in proportion to your faith. And then if you can't prophesy in faith, then I want you to do the following. I want you to ask God for the wisdom and the strength and directions. I don't want you to get up there now and send a message to the people if you truly don't believe that you can do it. The reason being, prophets in the Old Testament were messengers of God that conveyed what was on his heart and mind. Paul knew this. He knew that there were some people who were prophesying but may not have been prophesying in what the Lord was telling them to do. They were afraid. Some were afraid and some were just out and out saying what they wanted to say. You know, my church, I founded it. This is what I do in my church because mama said it, daddy said it, everybody said it. So I'm going to say it. It's a lie. Prophesy the message. And if you can't say what God says, don't open your mouth. Because those words can wound. Those words can turn a person in another direction where God may be leading them, you prophet lying over them, may lead them in another direction, in another place, which God may not want them to go. But because you spoke it, they believe it because you are, we are children of the Most High God. So people are watching, people are looking, people are studying us to see how we act, what we do, how we react in situations. When things get tougher, when things get hard, what do we do? Do we represent God? Or do we become like the world? And that's what he's asking us. Are we going to conform to the world? Or are we going to be transformed by the renewing of our minds? Paul then provides us with a list of gifts and the characteristics and attributions of the person who possessed them. He says, for example, if you are a minister, here are the attributes, or some of the attributes, it's not limited, I'm not limited, this list is a very limited list. He said, you're loyal, you're compassionate, and you're a good listener. You don't sit down and say, Lord, I wish you shut up. <laughs> it's getting on my nerves. <laughs> if that's you, please, don't minister. But instead, you have to be compassionate. You have to empathize. You have to have apathy. You have to know when to listen. You have to know when to talk. You have to know when to counsel. And you have to know when it's time to tell the truth. It hurts. But God gives us the ability as ministers to do that. And if he doesn't, again, it's not for you to do so. Next, he talks about the gifts of teachers. They're logical, they're analytical, and maybe even good thinkers. Sometimes they think outside the box, and God will use them to not necessarily go forth and do something, but to set it up. See, as a teacher, God allows us to think differently about a situation. He allows us to set up the situation, but it may not necessarily be our calling to go forth and do what he's asked us to do in that sense. We are the setup people. We are the ones who can look at it and analyze it. Mm, maybe here, maybe there, maybe we should go this, maybe we should go that. But not always are we to lead it, but maybe we are to set it up, give a different perspective. Next, there are the encouragers. These are the people who motivate who praise and applaud the efforts of others. You ever see that or had that grandma say, baby, you can do it. You know you're flat and out of tune and you said it all wrong and everything is just wrong. But there's that one person who comes to you and says, you know what? You did a wonderful job. You know, that was beautiful. You know that you're broken inside or you're confused and you're not really understanding the message that God has given you. But that encourager comes along and says, guess what? It may look hard. But you can do it. Have you ever been in that situation where they left you all alone or you were in a boardroom and everybody expected you to fail? Everybody just put it on you. Oh, you're going to be the fall guy in this situation. But God sends an encourager to sit right beside you to say you can do it. I have. I was on an interview once, and it was for my current position in the school system. And um, at the time, I wasn't... <clears throat> 
really, uh, <laughs> I should say, tactful. Okay. <laughs> and um, I had happened to be in a place previously, YCS, Youth, youth Council, Consultative Services, and I worked with behavioral, um, emotionally disturbed children. And at that point, um, I was uh, told, well, you're going to have to do a reading program. And I knew there was a certain pay scale for it. And I said, I'm not doing this. <laughs> I, I, I refuse to do it. You pay me, and I'll do it. Pay me my worth. Well, I decided uh, that at the time, well, me and a friend of mine, we decided that we were going to leave. So I applied for a position somewhere else. And when I got into the interview, there was this woman. And as she walked by, it was almost as if in slow motion, she walked by and she looked at me. Mm -mm, what's wrong with her? <laughs> you know, she looked at me and I'm like, why is she looking at me that way? What's going on? So she began to look. Now, mind you, God has a sense of humor because I told you before, I wasn't always calm and sweet. <laughs> me and my silly self go into the interview and get into an argument with the Patterson Board of Ed Superintendent Reading Director. Now, I told you that previously, the director at YCS wanted me to teach a reading program. I told her she was out of her mind. The same man, Dr. Morasnik, God bless you wherever you are, sir. He, <laughs> I had failed accounting, and this man uh, happened to be in the interview, and he and I were going back and forth. And he was telling me, well, you failed this accounting. What makes you think you can be a teacher? I looked at him and said, because I failed accounting, and when I took it over, I passed it. So that makes me a better teacher, because I didn't give up. My mentor, Gail, looked at me, and she winked. I said, oh, ooh, this is good. She motivated me, because I said at that time, I said, oh, Lord, it's over. <laughs> I might as well give it up, because me and my stupid self, I'm arguing. Instead of being a professional, I'm arguing with the man. To make a long story short, she encouraged me. And when I finally got hired in Patterson, he was the one who called me to teach reading. Now, that's, that just blew my mind because that's God. And when God encourages you, when you don't have the skill set, when you don't have the knowledge, God will give you all that you need. But he will send somebody to confirm that that is what I'm doing for you. So to those who are afraid, for those who need encouragement or praise, stick with him. God's got your back. Don't worry about what others say. If they tell you you can't do it, that's all right. My God said I can. He said I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Don't worry about the naysayers. If God gave you something to do, just do it. He's going to equip you, and he's going to send someone to whisper in your ear, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. And when you feel like giving up, say, God, I, I know you got me. You wouldn't bring me this far to make me. Then there are the givers. And I know there are so many givers in this church. They are so generous. God provides them with resources so that they can give. However, they may find themselves surrounded by those who may take advantage of them and their gift for giving. But they begin to back off. But I'm here to tell you, be encouraged. Your giving is channeled by God. And as you continue to pour out, God will continue to pour into you. Not only money, but he'll give you back your time. He'll give you back talents. He'll give you more talents. He'll give you more gifts. He'll give you more treasures. Just keep giving. Because when you stop giving, God will dry up the resource. But when you give, when you give from your heart, when you pour out to those in need, when you pour out every time somebody asks you, that's God. He's using you as a channel for giving. Then there are the, are the leaders, or those who lead. They show diligence. They work hard. They persevere, and they don't quit. Even when others don't quite seem to understand the vision. We know many pastors like that. When we're on a different path that God placed us, people look at you strange. They may not understand. But one thing we have to understand is God didn't give us the vision. He gave him the vision or her the vision. And because he gave him or her the vision, let them carry it out. 
Don't you try to weasel your way in there trying to think that you can carry out the vision because all you're going to do is mess it up. All you're going to do is cause confusion. All you're going to do is cause division in the body of Christ. We have to understand that that is the vision of the pastors and the preachers and that if we're going to do anything, what we need to do is to support them. Support them in a way that they know that we are with them. Give them an encouraging word. Support them financially. Ask them what can be done. And then when they tell you what can be done, say, oh, okay, fine. Don't do that. I did that once. I'll be honest with you. I'm, I guess it's open book for me today. But anyway, I did that once, and um, it wasn't pretty. Because what it did, it causes confusion in my mind. It causes insecurity. It causes you to doubt yourself. But when you just go ahead and do, when you see something that needs to be done, just do it. Bring it to the pastor. Pastor, you know what? I see this area that needs something, it needs something done. Can I do it? Ask permission. And then when he gives you the permission, go ahead and do it. Don't worry about it. If you're sincere, God will provide for you. But don't sit down on the gift. You have been gifted to do various things. Don't sit down on it, but go forth. Don't look back. Yes, there's going to be difficulties. There's going to be roadblocks. But God is in the forefront, and he will not allow any of us to fail. Finally, if your gift is showing mercy, you are happy to give and serve others. You don't get an attitude every time somebody asks you to do something. It ain't my job. Mm -mm, I ain't doing that. That's her job. No, you do it because you do it unto the Lord. You do it because that's what God requires us to do, to give our best. So we have to do it, and we have to do it cheerfully. We have to understand that no one person can embody all these gifts. But if we work together, God will manifest his power in each and every one of us. And we'll, we, we will become a forceful, well-oiled, unified, prayed-up church who glorify God in all that we do. Living like a Christian is an easy saints. But as stated, we are all family. We are one body in Christ. We have to hate what is evil. Don't just please ourselves. We have to be kind and affectionate to each other, not standoffish or cold. We have to show some love. We are called to be fervent in spirit. Work hard for the Lord, not be lazy. We have to rejoice in hope. We have to be patient in our trials and tribulations. And just remember this, trials are no excuse for not loving each other. Yes, you're going through a difficult time. Yes, it hurts. Yes, you're angry. Yes, you're disappointed. But that's no reason for you not to love someone. Because by showing love to them, they will repay that love. And maybe that will be the same person who will come to your rescue, who will have a word from the Lord, who will be able to bring you out and pray with you over this situation. You do it because God says to do it. And because if you don't do it, could you imagine how God would feel if you say to him, Lord, I'm going through. I don't feel like doing it. What about Jesus? You see, it's not about us. What did Jesus do? He went to the cross. He was beaten. He was brutalized. He was spat upon. He was kicked. He was lied on. He was despised. But yet, he kept going. He didn't say, I ain't doing it. I'm not going to do it. Jesus said, God, if it be your will, let it be done. Another thing, associate with those less fortunate than you. You never know where your life is going to take you. You may be on the top today. Woe unto you, though. Tomorrow may be another day. Tomorrow may be so hard for us. I've known people who have been on the top. And they've come tumbling down. They've come tumbling down. But as I said before, if we present ourselves as a living sacrifice, if we can tr um, transform our hearts and our minds to the will of God, if we live in total and complete submission of God, we will find the love in our hearts for one another. 
yes, we are family. Yes, this is a hospital. Yes, we are dysfunctional. Yes, we fight. Yes, we disagree. Yes, we hurt one another. But, but because we are created in God's image, let us remember that God is our source, our help, our healer, our peacemaker. So let us walk in love, forgetting those things which are behind. Let us look towards the glorious future that God has for each and every one of us as the body of Christ. Let's forgive. Let's be joyful. Let's be patient. Let's be faithful. Let's share. Let us rejoice with one another. Let us mourn with one another. Let us do the things that God asked us to do. And saints, watch God elevate us. For I'm here to tell you, eyes have not seen, nor ears heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Love one another because it's not about us. It's about Jesus. God bless you.